Good morning, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. Thank you for coming out on a Saturday morning in the Iowa snow uh, to hear us. Our main teaching will be for today will be this evening. We'll be looking from the book of Jeremiah tonight. And tomorrow we'll be looking at the ninth judge. The ninth judge um, from the book of Judges will be looking at Jephthah, Jephthah tomorrow. But uh, this morning I'd like to do something uh, that responds to a practical need, that responds to a practical need. Uh, not the kind of thing we did last night, but something that has to be addressed. And sometimes Bill addresses it, or I've addressed it, or other people have addressed it, but it seems to be an issue that's getting more and more problematic and causing more and more confusion. So this is just looking at a practical issue, and it's something all of you would have, would have encountered. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your goodness, your mercy and kindness. Open our eyes to your word, to its glory, Lord God, and its meaning. Give us understanding and wisdom in these last days as we await the return of your Son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Of course, in the original Hebrew or Greek text, we have no division between the chapters. People inserted those divisions at a later point. They have their advantages. They help us remember where things are. But it's very arbitrary where you would put the divisions. Sometimes it, it can just psychologically or naturally create an artificial discontinuum where there's no reason to, to have a discontinuum. You should just read one chapter following the next if the chapter wasn't there, but people tend to forget that. It creates an artificial barrier. So on one hand, it has a practical advantage. Everybody knows that. On the other hand, it potentially creates a disadvantage. Creates a disadvantage. That's just the way it is. But let's understand this, this further. We've explained many times that the last days of Judah and the last days of Samaria, in other words, the events around 585, 586 B.C. and the events around 720, 721 B.C. with the fall of Samaria, prefigure the last days. The Hebrew prophets create a milieu that the New Testament draws on to explain what the last days are going to be like. For instance, the themes like fallen, fallen is Babylon in the book of Revelation, or the prophecies of Jesus about the temple and the false prophets that would come in the last days. Well, these things basically, the verses that are quoted in the New Testament come straight from the book of Jeremiah, or from the book of Isaiah, or the book of Joel. They have a dual meaning. They're doubly referenced. These prophecies about what was going to happen with the Babylonian captivity in the book of Joel. Well, we see the New Testament draws on the book of Joel and says it happens again. You see the locusts and all these things in Revelation chapter 9. Somehow as Nebuchadnezzar's army came, that's a picture of what's going to come in the book of Revelation. The future is always in the past. We call this a Pesher interpretation. A Pesher interpretation. Where... Something in one historical setting, one prophecy for one historical situation is a picture of a future one. This explains the way the New Testament handles, handles the Old Testament. Pesher interpretations. Well, Isaiah is one of the books that are most important in understanding the last times. Isaiah speaks much of the first coming of Jesus, and he speaks just as much as the, as, about the second coming of Jesus. Remember, the first coming of Christ always teaches about his second. The first coming of Christ always teaches about his second. We've explained this before many times, but for the sake of the recording and for perhaps visitors, I'll go through it very quickly. When Jesus came the first time, there were signs in the cosmos. When he comes in the second time, there'll be signs in the cosmos. When he came the first time, you had a deified Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, who was assigning people numbers to economically control the known world. When Jesus comes the second time, you're going to have some kind of a deified leader of the reconfederated Roman Empire who's going to assign people numbers. They have to put the number on them, the number of the beast, in order to maintain economic control of the known world. Um, the Jews were in Israel having been deceived by the Romans. 
Pompey made a treaty with them, then the Romans broke it. Well, the Antichrist will make a treaty with the Jews and then break it. His first coming is always a picture of his second. We have to understand this, the way the, the, these things unfold prophetically. Well, so too, we all know Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, we all know this. Verse 6, For to us a child will be born, a son will be given to us, and the government will be upon his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. In Hebrew, his name will be called Peli Yoetz. Peli Yoetz. The term Peli is only ever used for God. It's a divine adjective. When the angel of the Lord appeared in the Old Testament, the parents of Sam, of uh, Samson asked, what's his name? He said, why do you ask my name? For it is Peli. <laughs> it is wonderful. It's only ever used for the Lord. Peli Yoetz. Wonderful counselor. Mighty God. El Gabor. El Gabor. This is no ordinary kid. Eternal Father. Avi Ad. And Prince of Peace. Sar Shalom. This points to the deity of Christ. It points to the deity of Christ. It's one of those passages that cause a lot of consternation to Jehovah's Witnesses, obviously. Okay. We have three sons. Three sons speaking in this passage. Three sons. Let's look at the first son. Turn with me back. Isaiah 7, 8, and 9. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 7, please. Verse 10. The situation was one under the reign of, of King Ahaz, where he was being pressured politically to go to Tilgat Pilzer III and look for aid from a foreign king instead of looking to the Lord. Now, this was a recurrent problem. It was certainly a problem with, with, with Hezekiah. Hezekiah was being pressured. In Isaiah 30 and 31, the same way, he was being pressured to go to Egypt for strategic aid against Assyria. And Isaiah was warning him. Isaiah was warning. Well, here we see the same thing happening in chapter 7, verse 10. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol, or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Listen now, O house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men? that you will try the patience of my God as well. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will be with a child and bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. This is a prophecy of the first son. The first son. Now, look what Ahaz says. He's challenged by the prophet. And God here is speaking to him through Isaiah and saying, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz. It wasn't Isaiah. The Lord said, ask God for a sign. And he says, I don't want to test the Lord. <laughs> There's a big difference between testing the Lord and acting in response to something he tells us. <laughs> it's a big difference. But when you know the lingo, <laughs> you can masquerade non-compliance with the divine will with religious speech. <laughs> and he does it. I mean, I see people have done this a lot. So have you. And it goes on, and he tells him that a virgin will conceive. The rabbis will tell you the word here is not virgin, it is not betula, it is alma in Hebrew, a young woman. And young women have babies every day, so how can the New Testament apply this to Jesus? Well, the Septuagint takes that word alma seven times and translates it parthenos. The Septuagint, the ancient rabbis, understood alma meant virgin. Only one place did they translate it young woman. This is one of the games the rabbis play. The rabbis try to give a modern definition to an ancient Hebrew word. For instance, in the Hebrew Confession of Faith, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. The ancient Hebrew word for one, the digit, the number, was Yahid. A rabbi named Rambam 
changed it in the Middle Ages to Ahad. Ahad meant achtut, oneness, a plural oneness. Oh, well, no, it's one. It, you know, we have one God, Ahad. In ancient Hebrew, Ahad meant our God is oneness, not, not the number one. The rabbi changed it in the Middle Ages. The rabbis will like to use the modern Hebrew term for an ancient one. And again, some of them even know what they're doing. Some of them even know what some... Not all rabbis are as educated as other rabbis. But some of them even know what they're doing. Quite a thing. Well, they do the same thing here. Seven times the ancient, their own ancient sages who translated the Septuagint translated it as virgin. So obviously it has a dual meaning. There is a meaning for that particular time somebody was going to be born who was going to herald the prophetic purposes of God concerning the strategic scenario they were in. But the New Testament applies this to the Messiah. The New Testament says this is about Jesus. A virgin will conceive. It'll be a sign. It's not a sign for a young woman to have a baby. You go to any maternity ward in any hospital anywhere, and there'll be a young woman having a baby any given day of the week. <laughs> Somewhere right now, a young woman is having a baby someplace, right this very second. That's not, how would that be a sign? How would that be? A, that's not a sign. There would have to be, obviously, something supernatural about it. Well, this one would come, and he will eat curds and honey at the time he knows, he, he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. We don't know how that was un folded or how that was fulfilled in the short term, but we do know it has a future meaning about the Messiah. That's his first coming. Then it speaks of another son, the second son, verse eight, chapter 8, verse 1. Predicting the fall of Damascus and Samaria. Then the Lord said to me, take for yourself a large tablet and write on it the letters, swift is the booty, speedy is the prey. Swift is the booty, easy is the prey. Meher shalal hashbaz. And I will take to myself unfaithful of, to myself faithful witnesses for testimony, Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jebekiah. So I approached the prophetess and she conceived and gave birth to a son. Then the Lord said to me, name him Meher shalal hashbaz. Now notice he approached her. Obviously he approached her in, 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 a, in, in a romantic sexual way. Uh, it could not be the same son because in the previous one it would be a virgin who will conceive. This one was simply procreated. For before the boy knows how to cry out my father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. It's predicting an invasion of Samaria and of, of, of Syria by the Assyrians. Now, obviously, this could only be fulfilled at that particular time. When you read the Old Testament, you're always trying to sort out certain things. What's literal, what's figurative, and what's both? What was for the, that time? What was for the first coming of the Messiah? What was for the second coming of the Messiah? And what's for both? <laughs> then it goes beyond that. What is specifically for Israel and the Jews... But what is for Israel and the Jews that also applies to the church? You're always trying to work these things out. Now, Isaiah 7, 8, and 9 would be a classical portion of Scripture where all three come into play. Is it Israel? Is it the church? Is it both? Is it literal? Is it figurative? Or is it both? Is it for that time? Is it for the first coming? Is it for the second coming? Or is it a combination? Isaiah 7, 8, and 9 bring all these things into play. They bring all these things into play. And the rabbis kind of knew that. What's really strange is when you read what the rabbis say about this stuff in the Talmudic literature, they kind of they, they understood it. It's frightening. It's frightening when you understand how much the ancient rabbis understood and still didn't believe in Jesus. It's frightening. It's frightening how much they actually understood but still did not have a saving faith. Now, if that's true of the rabbis, it's true of Christendom. So this first son comes, and it says, before this happens, before, you know, he'll eat curds and honey at that time, before he knows how to, 
do this enough to refuse evil and choose good, the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good before this happens, you know. Then the second kid, it's before this happens, this is what's going to take place. And then, of course, we have the third one. A child is born, a son is given. We've got the three sons. His first coming is chapter 7. The specific time that they're talking about is chapter 8. Chapter 9 is his second coming. <laughs> you've got his first coming, you've got his second coming, and you've got that specific time. You've got all three time frames come into play. So we know that what happened then is a picture of what's going to happen at the end in some way. Then it continues. Verse 5 of chapter 8. And again the Lord spoke, Inasmuch as these people have rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloach and rejoiced in the resin and in the son of Remedia. Now therefore, behold, the Lord is about to bring on them the strong and abundant waters of the Euphrates, even the kings of Assyria and all his glory, and it will rise up over all its channels and go over all its banks. Then it will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass through. It will reach even to the neck, and the spread of its wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. Now the son's name from chapter 7, is Emmanuel. It's Christ's land. The land of Israel belongs to Jesus. Zechariah 12, he says, it's his land. It's saying what's going to happen. The Assyrian invasion would be a judgment. It would be a judgment on God's people because they've turned to those things. They've turned to those things. They reject the flowing waters of Shiloak. Shiloak comes from the Hebrew word Shaliak, apostle, one who was sent. We call it in English, we translate it the pool of Siloam, the pool in Jerusalem, which was the reservoir, the water supply. It's been excavated now. Okay. Well, we know what the living waters are, the figure of the Holy Spirit, according to John 7 and Isaiah 44. They reject this and they look to pagan things. They reject this and they begin looking to the pagan world for spiritual meaning and depth. I was talking to some friends last night. We were drinking coffee and so forth after the meeting at a restaurant. And I to told them the time I was in India and I saw what, what Hinduism really is. You don't really see what Eastern religion is until you go to where it comes from. I was in India and I saw the, the, the baby was left there to, to, to starve, basically, and they were feeding cow sacks of wheat. Look what Hinduism has done for India. Why will people in the Western world go to gurus and ashrams? Look what that religion has done for India. I wrote a note in a book, The Death of a Guru, about a guru who got saved, and it was co-authored by Dave Hunt, and I wrote a, 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 a page note for George Harrison from the Beatles. And my friend was the oral hygienist who used to clean his teeth. Our office in England is near the George Harrison's castle. And he came in to get his teeth cleaned, and she gave him the book. And she, he read what I wrote in the book. <laughs> if you grew up in the slums of, of, of Calcutta instead of the slums of Liverpool, you'd think you'd be living in this castle. <laughs> my grandmother was from Liverpool. And uh, <laughs> he, he was so angry. He threw the book. Then he took the book with him. And when he walked out of the dental surgery, he took the book with him, and he, and, and he went out. He took the book, and he gave him the gospel make of it what you will. And right, right after that, somebody broke into his castle and stabbed him in the chest. And about a year after that, he died in Los Angeles chanting Hare Krishna. Why would, you turn, why would people in the West turn to these Maharajas? <laughs> I've been there. I've seen what that religion is. I went to Bad Ning in China one time. I was smuggling Bibles in China and I went to Bad Ning to an acupuncture clinic. I wanted to see what it was really like. It wasn't what you see here in the acupuncture clinics in Chicago or something like that. Here, at least, they're trying to draw a distinction between what might have an actual physiological basis and what comes from Taoism. If, you know, you're looking at concentrations of sympathetic angry and applied pressure. Okay, there are people trying to make clinical and scientifically critical arguments about 
acupuncture, acupressure therapy. But when you go to where it comes from, it's simply Taoism. They had this white wine with six different species of poison snakes dead in the, in the wine floating around in there with seepage of toxins coming out of the snakes into the wine and they were selling it by the... They were, people were paying like $150 for a tablespoon as an aphrodisiac. <laughs> it's all based on Taoism. You don't, see, you don't see what Eastern religions really are until you go to these places. When you go and you see what it is, even Roman Catholicism, you don't see real Roman Catholicism in this country. If you want to see real Roman Catholicism, you have to go to the Philippines or Mexico or Ireland or somewhere like that to see what it actually is. You have to go to a Catholic country to see what it really is. They didn't know what they were looking at. Well, today it's the same. These people in the West who speak about Islam, they don't even know what they're talking about. I've lived in the Middle East for years. They don't know what Islam, a religion of peace and tolerance. That's what they tell you. President Bush puts a copy of the Koran in the White House to honor Islam after September 11th. It's a religion of peace and tolerance. Let them build a mosque on ground zero. Why do they want to name it the Cordoba Mosque? Because Cordoba represents Islamic conquest of the West. <laughs> the guy himself, the question, not should they build the mosque, should the guy who wants to build it not be stripped of his citizenship? Did he make... Uh, that he immigrate to the United States on a false pretense. If he always believed in a caliphate, and he's publicly said he believes in an Islamic caliphate, he does not support the Constitution of the United States. He, made, he, he became a citizen on a false pretense. He should be stripped of his citizenship. If that's the case, then... Well, but, well, you ask them, listen, I've been all over the Muslim world. I've been to Malaysia. I've been to Indonesia. I've been to uh, I've been Brunei. I've been to the Persian Gulf. I've been to Egypt. I've been to Morocco. I've been to I was just in Jordan several weeks ago. Yes, can you show me, please, one Islamic country that is either peaceful or tolerant? Can you show me one Muslim country that will give Christians and Jews the rights they have in America or in Israel or in Canada? They can't show you one. Now Bush knew he was lying. Obama knows he's lying. They know they're lying. Show me one. You don't see what these religions are until you actually go <laughs> to where it is. You've got to actually go to where it is to see what it is. What you're seeing is a sanitized, modified, culturally repackaged version to get you into it, but they, they don't tell you what it really is. They never tell you. And so Isaiah opens his book by saying, my people are filled with influences from the east. Babylon was in the east. It always comes from the east. All false religion came from Babylon. In India, it came from the west. Where did Hinduism come from? India, no, it came from Persia. The people with the lighter skin were the highest caste. They were the Brahmins. As your skin got darker, as you went further south in India, your caste became lower. It's all based on racism. <laughs> it's all based on racism. It's based on the, it's racism. That's your karma. You, the white people are the higher caste. And you, that's how they, where did it come from? Well, it didn't come from India. All these things came from Babylon. Right. All these things came from Babylon. My people are filled with influences from the East. We've pointed out a number of times. There are three times, just in the history of the church, there are three times when Eastern religion invaded Western Christendom. The first was with the post-Nicene church fathers after Oregon. Gnosticism came into the church. That was the first time Eastern religion invaded the West, invaded Christianity. Second time it happened, the Crusades. When the troubadours went for the spice trade to India and so forth, they brought back the influences of Hinduism and Shia Islam into Europe. That was the second. The statues, the incense, the prayers on beads, that was the second time. This is the third time. Today, it's the emergent church. Eastern religion invading the West. But this is not new. It happened in ancient Israel. It happened before the destruction of Judah. It happened before the destruction of Samaria. The people looked to Eastern religions, Isaiah said. And here's what they're doing. They're looking. You rejoice in Rezin and Ramalia, therefore, the Euphrates is going to drown you. <laughs> We're being drowned. I live in England. 
in order to survive as a society and a culture, every couple needs 2.1 kids minimum. Okay? God bless you guys in Iowa. <laughs> Somebody's got to keep Social Security coming. And thank God for the long winters. Every time I come back, you have more babies. But, but you understand, Iowa's an exception. If it wasn't for places like Iowa, and if it wasn't for, no matter what your feeling is immigration, if it wasn't for the Hispanic population, America would be facing the same demographic crisis you have in Europe. Especially in light of the fact we've aborted 53 million babies. You know how many people, how many children the average couple has in England? One. The average couple in Holland? One. The average couple in Germany? The average German couple? One. The average Dutch couple? One. The average British couple? One. The average the average Islamic family in Western Europe, 8.3. Now, unfortunately, our own corrupt politicians are giving them visas. They're trying to correct the problem here. <laughs> They're trying to do to us what they have in Europe, make it a socialist country and open the doors to these guys coming in. Our own politicians are trying to destroy the country, it appears to me. I've seen what they did in Europe. What is this? 8.3? Always begins with the appearance of being benign. Or a religion of peace and tolerance. Until they get a foot in the door. They cannot show you a single, single country that's allowed Islamic immigration that does not have social turbulence as a result. Violence. Malmo, Sweden. Taken over by Islamic gangs. Taken over by gangs. They're outlawing the reading of Dante's Inferno. In, in schools in Europe because it offends Muslims. Just, they don't want Holocaust Observance Day in, in, because it offends Muslims to say there was a Holocaust to the Jews. Holland, Germany, France. You had three weeks of riots in the Banlieue in Paris. Three weeks of riot, burning cars. A couple of billion dollars worth of damage. It went on for three weeks. It's always then. Bradford riots in England. The wave comes in. Well, why does it come in? It is a judgment. Why does somebody want to build a mosque in New York with the approval of our own politicians? And a Jewish mayor, Blomberg, in favor of it. Why? Same reason it happened here. It's the same thing you see happening in Isaiah chapter 8. These things are not new. We're told again... 1 Corinthians 10, the history of Israel. Why was it written? Paul tells us. Verse 11, these things happened to them as an example, written for our instruction. Verse 6, these things happened as examples for us, that we should... The whole history of Israel was written down so we would not make the same mistakes. But we're making the same mistakes, doing the same stuff. He says it will go up to your neck in verse 8. Well, we see this in our chapters 36 and 37 under King Hezekiah and Isaiah when um, Sennacherib sent Rabshakeh. They conquered beginning in Lachish and they took over most of Judah, most of the south, but they didn't get Jerusalem. They only got up to the neck. The head was still sticking out. God was merciful. You have to continue reading the book to see how it was fulfilled. You get to chapter 36, 37. It will reach even to the neck and spread its wings, but you'll fill, <coughs> the spread of its wings will fill the breath of your land, O Emmanuel. Fortunately, it's his land. It only went up to the neck. With the Syria, it, with the Samaria, it went over the head. In other words, Will you still have some faithful people left? The invasion only went so far. Where God's people became reprobate, looked at these religions, it went over their head and they couldn't get out of it. It's the same thing now. Amen. The World Council of Churches, finished. Mainstream Protestantism, finished. That Lutheran church across the field, 
that the Lutheran World Congress finished. It finished. The flood will go up to the neck. Then it continues. Be broken, O peoples, and be shattered. Give ear, all remote places of the earth. Gird yourselves, yet be shattered. Gird yourselves, yet be shattered. Where you see that kind of poetic language, where a phrase is repeated twice, here it happens to be, gird yourselves, yet be shattered. Gird yourselves, yet be shattered. Get ready, but still going to be broken. Well, the word in Hebrew can be translated dismayed. Well, you see that kind of repetition. It's always a literary device to indicate something eschatological. Whenever you see that kind of repetition, the text is always, always has an eschatological nuance. It's always something for the last days. It says it twice. In other words, not just for now. That has another meaning. Devise a plan, but it will be thwarted. State a proposal, but it will not stand. They always come up with their own ideas. For God is with us, for thus the Lord spoke to me with mighty power and instructed me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, You are not to say it's a conspiracy in regard to all that this people call a conspiracy. And you are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. It's the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy. And he shall be your fear. And he shall be your dread. Then he will become a sanctuary. But to both the houses of Israel, a stone to strike and a rock to stumble over. And a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now, of course, Jesus refers in part to this verse, as well as to a psalm. The stone that the builders was rejected has become a cornerstone will be broken, be crushed, that kind of thing. And many will stumble over them, and they will fall and be broken, and will even be snared and caught. Bind up the testimony, seal up the Torah among my disciples, and I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will even look eagerly for him. Well, the house of Jacob is always ethnocentric. Israel can be applied to the church. But when you see Jacob, it's always ethnocentric to the Jews. Okay? He's hidden from Israel. Emmanuel is hidden from Israel. But Isaiah is saying the following. He's saying, I'll wait for him who's hiding his face. I'll even look eagerly for him. We should be looking for the coming of Emmanuel, of Jesus. That should be what we're focused on, his coming. We need to understand Jacob can't see him. The Jews don't recognize their own Messiah apart from a faithful remnant. But we should be looking for him to come. That should be our focus. That's, right. That's what we should be thinking about. And as we're told in verse 14, he becomes our sanctuary. Fear him, not this other stuff. Well, what was happening? The people were becoming obsessed with conspiracies. This is happening. That's happening. There's a plan to do this. Oh, somebody's trying to get to the king, and Ahaz is doing this. And, you know, Rabshakeh is doing that, and, you know, there's a... Cons he says, bind up the Torah. Look to the Word of God. Look to the coming of the Messiah. Look to the one that Jacob can't see yet, who's hidden. <coughs> Instead, they were being caught up in conspiracies. That is one of the things that happened at this particular time. And it is going to happen in the last days. In fact, it is happening. Not a day of the week practically goes by when I do not get an email about a conspiracy theory from a Christian organization. There is hardly a venue I go to where somebody that does not come up to me and give me an envelope with all this, what they consider to be research about the Illuminati or something like that. <coughs> and, and symbols. and all. People become focused on these conspiracies. 
oblivious to the fact that in the secular world you have conspiracy theorists. There are people in the secular world who are conspiracy theorists. They become obsessed. Some of them become delusional and require psychiatric diagnosis and treatment. They become paranoid to the point where if you disagree with what they're proposing, you are part of the conspiracy. <laughs> You're a member of the Illuminati or something like that. Now, the problem with conspiracy theories is this. There is always a measure of truth in what they say. There is some degree of truth in what they say. We should certainly be watching world events in light of Scripture, but the key is in light of Scripture. Based on conjecture, without any documented evidence, without any proof, they extrapolate all these scenarios that can't be proven, of which there are logical arguments against them very often, and that becomes what they're taken up with. Now, this is just in the secular world. If you just go on a search engine and Google Kennedy assassination, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of websites. Thousands about who knocked off Kennedy. The mafia, and the, the, you know, the, 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 the communists and the CIA, there's just no end to it. And they all construct these... <laughs> Now, there's some truth in what they say, but there's no end to it. What happens when this gets into the church? And what is mere conspiracy theory becomes called end time prophecy, becomes reframed as Christian discernment becomes rechristened as apologetics. Well, all it is is conspiracy theory, but they put it into a Christian packaging. Then they think this is their ministry. Now, when you look what the Bible says about discernment, at where people who will function in discernment, it's, it's like a, it's mainly an Old Testament idea of watchmen on the walls. You watch to see what's coming in the distance, but Hosea said, um, uh, uh, Habakkuk said, I'll take my stand on the watchtower. You know, even the Jehovah's Witnesses know the watchtower is a picture of the Word of God. You can see what's coming by going up the watchtower. Well, if you stand on the Word of God, you can see the future. Okay. That's what we're supposed to be doing. These people become engrossed in this stuff. This is a Magen David. A star of David? No, in Hebrew it's a Magen David. A shield of David. <laughs> to Jews it's not a star. It's a shield. And they variously give it different interpretations. Each space represents one of the tribes around the Holy Ark. That's one of the main ones. Okay. To the Jews it's a shield, it's not a star. Yes, it was a pre-Christian, a pre-Jewish pagan symbol. Not a pentagram for the witches, but the six-pointed stars in Egypt and, 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 and uh, Phoenicia. Oh, it's a demonic symbol. And the Illuminati copied it from the Kabbalists. Okay, this is what it means. It's about Satan. It's a star, you know. This, it's not a star, it's a shield. The fact of the matter is, the symbol of the early Christians was not a cross, it was a fish. But you can prove with archaeology. You can prove with archaeology in Gaza and in uh, Crete that the fish was a symbol of Dagon, the fish god of the Philistines. The fish was a pre-Christian pagan symbol. The mitre, the bishop's hat, it came from that Dagon worship. <laughs> It was a pre-Christian pagan symbol. When I was a kid, the space program began. First they had the Mercury. Then they had the Gemini. Two astronauts in one. Then they had the Apollo. 
These were simply project names for the American space program. In the ancient world, these were names of gods associated with Greek mythology and the practice of astrology. <laughs> In our cultural context, they were simply project names after constellations or planets or things like this for the space program. But originally those things were Greek mythology, demonic occult practices like astrology. Can you say they shouldn't have named two astronauts in the same capsule? Oh, the space program is demonic. <laughs> Going to the moon was evil. It's the same thing. It is what a symbol represents in a given culture that determines if it's evil or not. It is well known. I can show you. You've got the cross. You have the Celtic cross. The cross was a pre-Christian pagan symbol, symbol of the Druids. In, in England and Ireland and Scotland and Wales. I'm um, sorry, Scotland, Wales and England. The cross was a pre-Christian pagan symbol. We should get rid of the cross. We should get rid of the fish. It's not Ichthos, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. That's about Dagon. You should get rid of the shield of David. It's really a star. You... Keep away from the space program. Refuse to pay your taxes. They're financing things called Apollo and Gemini. You're dealing with blithering idiocy. <laughs> Ignorance gone mad. <clears throat> but they're calling it religion. Conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories inevitably tend to take on some kind of a bigoted or racist undertone. You've got the identity movement in this country. They actually denigrate Black people is beast of the fields. It's white supremacists. White supremacists. You see that these people tend to be inherently anti-Semitic. They get into replacement theology and they begin hating, hating the Israel, the Jews. It's a Zionist conspiracy. <laughs> That's what they do. That's what they do. And some of these people are really crazy. Peter Ruckman, the patriarch of the King James Only movement, He's on his third marriage. There's a tape of him calling black people niggers. And he says, look at Elvis Presley. First he began to sing like a nigger, then he began to dance like a nigger. He says, this is in a church. He's a racist preaching this way in a church. So you say, how can you follow this man? What he says about the... Well, he reads the King James. I was talking to Pastor Bill the other day. When the Puritans came to this country, when the pilgrims came on the Mayflower, you know why they came on the Mayflower? To escape King James. He was persecuting them. He was putting them in prison. He was killing born-again Christians in England. His mother was Catholic Mary, Queen of Scots. When the pilgrims, who we most associate with bringing Christianity to America, came, they used the Geneva Bible. They would not use the King James Bible. Because in the 1611 edition of the King James Bible, it listed Roman Catholic feast days. Feast days of Mary. It quoted the uh, <coughs> Apocrypha as, as, as Scripture, the way the Catholic Bible does. They said, this is a Catholic Bible. They, they considered it to be what we would call ecumenical. They didn't use that term. But they said, this, is, this has got too much Catholic influence in it. We don't want to, we, we're Puritans. We want to be pure. We want the pure Word of God. They wouldn't touch the King James Bible. They were persecuted in England by King James. Every historian you can imagine, whoever wrote about King James, says he was no good, including Churchill. Most of them say he was a homosexual. King James. You've got these people. They determine your orthodoxy, your commitment to Christ, not based on what you believe, not based on how you live, but on what translation of the Bible you read. <laughs> now, I'm not putting down the King James Bible. God has used it. It's based on the translations of people like Coverdale, uh, Tyndale and so forth, and the work of Coverdale. I respect those people. Um, what they did, they, they, they were faithful to the best manuscripts they had at that time. I'm not putting down 
the, the work that the King James is based on at all. I have a high regard for people like William Tyndale, obviously. And I, I have nothing bad to say about the King James. It's a valid translation, even though it does have errors. It's still a valid translation. It's better than a lot of the modern ones. I'm not saying anything against the King James or against people who read it. But when you lift up a translation of a translation, a 17th century translation of a translation, and make that the be-all and end-all to determine orthodoxy, this is crazy. But if you read what they write, the Ripplinger, a complete charlatan. She can't even read Greek or Hebrew. Her degree is in home economics. But if you're not reading that, you're part of the ecumenical conspiracy. Look with me, please, to Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. And they read from the book, from the law, the Torah of God, translating or explaining to give the sense so that they understood the reading. After the Babylonian captivity, when the Jews came back from Babylon, they spoke Aramaic, they spoke Chaldee. Only the Levites and some other people could still speak Hebrew. They didn't know their own language anymore. They didn't know the language of Scripture anymore. Somebody had to translate what the Hebrew meant into Chaldee for them. Later, this was written down. It was called the Targums. The Targums. You have major Targum, Ancleos, Targum, Yonatan. These are Targums in Aramaic. This is the only verse in the Bible that speaks about translation. There's only one verse in the Bible that plainly speaks about translation. Nehemiah 8.8. 8. And it says the priority is on the original meaning of the original language. The priority is on the original meaning of the original language. There's only one verse of the 32,000 verses in Scripture, only one speaks of translation. And it says that. The priority is on the original meaning of the original language. Ruckman actually teaches the additions, the additions to the King James Bible of 1611 or further revelation. And this 16th, 17th century translation of a translation supersedes the original meaning of the original languages. And to them, that's everything. And if you don't agree with it, you're deceived. And if you're a pastor who doesn't agree with it, you're part of the ecumenical conspiracy. <laughs> Forgetting that the Christians in the 17th century thought that the King James Bible was part of an ecumenical conspiracy. <laughs> Ignorance gone mad. They become obsessed with this stuff. Some of these people are crazy. They're racist in many cases. They're certainly anti-Semitic. And it also becomes a racket and an industry. I speak of people like Tex Mars. These people are quite dangerous. If you pay attention to them. Now, it's hard to imagine how any biblically literate Christian who was led by the Holy Spirit would pay attention to such people. Frankly, it's difficult to, to, to understand how anybody in their right mind could pay attention to such people. But a lot of people pay attention to them. They get taken in by this stuff. They're more concerned about the Illuminati and the Freemasons. Now look, it's, it's fine to be aware of that stuff. No Christian should be a Freemason. That's obvious. Let no one bind you with an oath. It's got occult influences. That we know that no Christian should be that. Of course, what it was in the 18th century is different than what it is now. But still, nobody who's saved should be in these secret lodges with these oaths and these things, like these blood oaths. That's obvious. Nobody's saying anything other. No Christian should be a Mason. I'll be the first one to say no saved Christian should be involved in Masonic Lodges. But that becomes what they're consumed with. That's what they're looking at all the time. <coughs> there was that guy, John Todd. <coughs> Scaremongering. Well, Isaiah said, Thus says the Lord... You are not to say it's a conspiracy in regard to all this people say 
is a conspiracy. They were looking at the wrong stuff. What they should have been looking for was the coming of Emmanuel. Amen. What they should have been looking at was the Scripture. Bind the Torah. Bind the Word of God. Verse 17, I will wait for the Lord who's hiding His face in the house of Jacob. I'll look eagerly for Him. That's what was happening. That's what's happening now. With the same kind of consequences. Look what happens next. Verse 18, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and wonders in the same Vaniflaot in Hebrew in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. And when they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law, that is the Torah and the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it's because they have no dawn. They have no light. If they're not speaking in accordance with Scripture, they have no light. And they will pass through the land, hard-pressed and famished. And it will turn out that when they are hungry, they will be enraged and curse their king and their God as they face upward. Then they will look to the earth and behold the stress and darkness and gloom and anguish, and they will be driven away into darkness. What else was happening? What is the second thing that they were being sucked into? In part due to these Eastern religions. The occult. The occult. Before the Lord comes, there will be an explosion of the influence of the occult. People will be looking to what amounts to spirit mediums. Spiritism. Even consulting the dead. When you see a Roman Catholic kneeling down before a statue of a dead saint lighting a candle and, and, and praying, that's necromancy. They're calling on spirits of the dead. That's necromancy. But I'm not talking about Catholics. Benny Hinn says Catherine Coleman appears to him and all this, and he goes to Farmer's Lawn Cemetery to get the anointing from a grave. And they consult the dead. And people still send the money. They consult the dead. Spirit mediums. I'm telling you, what Rick Joyner says and does, he is a New Age ascended master. These people like Paul Kane and the, the Todd Bentley, they're either, well obviously they're charlatans, but they're either crazy or if there is something spiritual, they have a familiar spirit. What's known as avot, familiar spirits. They have a familiar spirit. They think it's Christian the way these people thought it was Jewish. The rabbis do the same thing with Kabbalah. Communicate with dead rabbis and all these ancient sages. And stuff. It's the same thing. It's necromancy. They consult mediums. Well, the Bible says there will be prophets and the, my old men will, you know, you'll see dreams and young men see... Dreams. Yeah. To the law and the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word. Whenever God gives a revelation, a prophecy, a real vision, it'll be based on Scripture. It'll be examinable in light of Scripture. Yeah. It'll be provable or disprovable by the Word of God. Amen. If it's not in accordance with the Word of God, it's not of Him. Todd Bentley's female angel, Emma, it's not scriptural. It can't be of God. Communication with the dead, it can't be of God. Even the one case where God allowed it, it was a judgment on Sarah. <laughs> if it doesn't agree with the division's not real, the prophecy's not different. I don't, I'm a Pentecostal, for want of a better term. I don't like to be called that anymore because of the connotation it has, but I certainly believe the gifts of the Spirit and so forth. 
the prophecy is real, the revelation is real, the vision is real. If the God spoke through a dream, it's going to be scriptural. It'll be verified by Scripture. It'll be in agreement with Scripture doctrinally. It can be tested with the Word of God. Oh, now the Bible goes out the window. They've got these courses, schools for prophecy, and how to prophesy. And how to... This is a cult. I've been warning for years. What they're calling prophecy is clairvoyance. Yeah. Rick Joyner and these guys, they're not prophets. They're clairvoyance. They're doing the same stuff. Oh, what's the word of the The stage hypnotist can, can invoke those kinds of responses and that kind of behavior. There are stage hypnotists who can do the same thing. That's what was happening. They were looking at the wrong stuff. Some of them were caught up in occult practices. That became their obsession. Imagining these occult practices to be somehow Judaic or Hebraic or Jewish, which for them would have been what Christian is now. The ones who were not doing that or the other ones were caught up in conspiracy theories. This past week, at Saddlebrook Church in California, Rick Warren's church, they had three New Age healers teaching Reiki. Open occult practice in Rick Warren's church. Openly occult. He's been involved with Ken Blanchard and all these other New Ages. It's openly occult. Openly. It's overt. Caught up in that? But then there's other people. Oh, I believe Jesus is coming. Have you heard about this? You're always giving you stuff about the Masons and the Illuminati and all this. King James only. Nuts. People were just nuts. And they're so sincere. They believe it. They, 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 that's what they do. There's people, they have websites, and all they do is talk about this stuff. And they think that's their ministry. They should be concentrating on missions and evangelism. They should be concentrating on planting churches, on discipleship. They should be concentrating on the Word of God. They should be concentrating on the coming of Christ. They should be putting the emphasis where Scripture says to put it. But instead they get diverted with this stuff. And they imagine it to be prophecy. They imagine it to be discernment. They imagine it to be apologetics. All it is is conspiracy theories sometimes reaching the point of clinical psychosis. And I'm not exaggerating. Clinical psychosis combined with demonic deception. They become delusional, paranoid, obsessed, nuts, dysfunctional, irrational. They're not looking at what they should be looking at. And they're not exercising any biblical expression of spirituality. What they think is spiritual is simply the occult. It's mysticism. It's mysticism. The Kansas City prophets, that's mysticism. That's not spirituality. The IHOP, the Mike Bickle, that's mysticism. He's a proven false prophet. He's a proven false prophet. It's mysticism. Quite a thing. Get your eyes on the wrong stuff. But Isaiah was told, don't say it's a conspiracy. Don't listen to that stuff. Don't fear what they fear. Don't dread what they dread. I'm not afraid of the Illuminati or the Freemasons. I'm afraid of the sin that so easily besets me in my own life. <laughs> I'm afraid of deception in the church. I'm not afraid of the Masons. Of course they're lost. And then the occult. People looking for spiritual experiences that are not biblically based. That are not based on rightly dividing the Word of God exegetically. Consult the mediums, the spiritists who whisper and mutter. Should people not consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? 
to the law, the Torah, the word of God and the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it's because they have no dawn. No, they have no dawn. If they had any dawn, if they had any light, if they really believed the word of God, anybody who believed the word of God would see through Rick Warren for themselves. They would see through Mike Bickle for themselves. The first and foremost defense against error is always a knowledge of the truth. It's just like in medical science, prevention is better than cure. <laughs> prevention is always better than cure. It would be wonderful if there was no need for me or Bill or somebody to stand up and say these things. But we're trying to correct the problem. If these people knew the Word of God, they wouldn't have the problem to begin with. But the problem existed in Isaiah's day. And the problem exists in our day. And the Lord says, keep away from that stuff. It's crazy and it will make you crazy and you'll drive other people crazy. Emmanuel, the Lord, shall become a sanctuary. Amen. Bind up the testimony, seal the law of God among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will even look eagerly for him. We wait for the return of Jesus. We look eagerly for him. That's where the emphasis should be and no place else. God bless. See you tonight.